How did the right-wing son of a German beer bottler become the Chancellor of Germany in 1923? How did this same man push his country through the economic turmoil following the First World War? And, perhaps most importantly of all, did he follow the path of peace, or did his actions lead to the more aggressive expansionism that was to follow in Germany's history in the period of the Third Reich? Stay tuned, for today on the History Chronicles, we will be examining the life of the enigmatic German statesman Gustav Stresemann. Gustav Stresemann was born on the 10th of May 1878 into a German empire that was only seven years old. Back in 1871, the country had been formed out of the ashes of the Franco-Prussian War by the Minister-President of Prussia, Otto von Bismarck. Germany was a young nation, but at the time of Stresemann's birth, it was an ambitious one. For centuries, the presence of a powerful German empire in the middle of Europe had been a problematic principle for France and Russia, the other great powers on the continent. Now Bismarck, as Prussian Chancellor, worked hard through treaties and negotiations to prevent these two powerful neighbours of the new Germany from building their own alliances. Bismarck's leadership and the work of his successor Leo Count von Caprivi allowed Germany to develop its ties with its neighbours and for German industry to flourish. In 1890, an Anglo-German naval agreement helped to stabilise Germany's relations with Great Britain through the abandonment of aggressive policy in East and West Africa. Commercial treaties were also made with Austria and Romania. At the top of German politics, however, was the Kaiser. Kaiser Wilhelm I, the King of Prussia, had been crowned German Emperor on the 1st of January 1871. He was now head of state over the union of numerous federated monarchs. This was, in essence, a position that had been carefully crafted by Bismarck as part of the new German constitution. In practice, though, Wilhelm I believed himself to rule by divine right. The Prussian monarchy was centuries old and brought with it the militaristic tradition of the most powerful state in the new German Union. The crown given by the constitution appeared to the Kaiser as an artificial creation, underpinned by politicians in the Reichstag, of whom the president was now head by royal appointment and the chancellor presided by election. How is this relevant to our story here? Well, Understanding the tensions within the German state will help us to better understand Stresemann's own positioning and political agenda when he came of age in German politics. As a child, Stresemann benefited from a good education and upbringing in a family that was part of Germany's growing middle class. At school, it was said that he was exceptionally passionate about history, as all good students should be of course, and took to enthusiastic study of the Emperor Napoleon and the German philosopher Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. At the age of 19, Stresemann became a student of political economy at the University of Berlin. It was here that he became formally engaged with the politics of the world around him, working as an editor of the Allgemeine Deutsche Universität Zeitung. His writings for this paper provide an outline of his political views at this time. Stresemann challenged the political parties of his time as broken, and grew confident in his own view of Germany that was at once liberal but also embraced the nationalism of the Kaiser and the militaristic establishment. In 1901, Stresemann completed his studies with a doctoral thesis on the beer bottling industry in Germany. He got good marks, despite ridicule from his peers. Almost immediately, Stresemann settled into the world of business that his father had been so familiar with. In 1902, he founded the Saxon Manufacturers Association, and in 1903, he married the daughter of a well-to-do Jewish businessman. Tragically, his Jewish wife, Katie Kleefeld, would later have to flee Germany with their children when the Nazis began to persecute the Jews in the 1930s. It was in his early adulthood that Stresemann became more immersed in German politics. This was at a local level at first, with Stresemann winning a place on Dresden Town Council in 1906. The following year, however, Stresemann made it to the Reichstag as the head of the National Liberal Party in Saxony. This party was essentially conservative, it was a staunch supporter of German business and nationalist ideology, with its base rooted in the educated middle classes. In the 1870s, under Bismarck, the National Liberal Party had dominated German politics, but as Stresemann started out in politics, the party had seen some decline in favour of the new kids on the block, the Social Democrats. This party held more liberal views on German traditions and society, and had been founded with some Marxist principles in mind. The Social Democrats had been banned under anti-socialist laws from 1878 to 1890, but 
since becoming legal, they had gained strong support in elections. By 1900, the Social Democrats had become the largest party in Europe with Marxist leanings, and the most popular at the German ballot box. Stresemann's early political career only saw fragments of success. He inhabited a delicate position that sat on the left of what was essentially a right-wing party. His attempts to expand social welfare reforms lost him the support of the National Liberal Party's Conservative group, and he lost both his position in the party and his seat in the Reichstag in 1912. Shaken but not defeated, Stresemann returned to the world of business and helped to found the German-American Economic Association, encouraging trade between the German Reich and the United States. Then, disaster. The First World War, which erupted in 1914, saw the carefully handled alliances of the 19th century explode into a fit of killing and destruction across Europe. The Kaiser's army, numbering almost 850,000 soldiers, engaged in armed conflict against its age-old enemies, France, Russia, and now Britain. But for Stresemann, the outbreak of war was not at odds with the world that he had grown up in, and the political consciousness of his youth. He had supported the Anglo-German naval race, and was behind German militarism as a means to foster and better protect Germany's trading network around the world. He was not sent to the front due to poor health, and instead, in a special election in December 1914, saw his seat returned to him in the Reichstag. During the war, Stresemann championed the cause of the right wing with increasing fervour. For him, it appeared that the war was defensive and necessary to extend Germany's historical claims on territory to its east in Poland and to its west in France and Belgium. In the Reichstag, he was an ardent supporter of Germany's military commanders, the Field Marshal Hindenburg and General Ludendorff the latter of whom was later to lend their support to the Nazis in the Munich Putsch of 1923. Stresemann was also in support of what perhaps became the most controversial policy of the war. This was unrestricted submarine warfare. Germany's pursuit of this policy, which essentially allowed for the destruction of neutral civilian vessels supplying arms and aid to Germany's enemies, was one of the reasons behind the USA's declaration of war in 1917. Stresemann also saw his own political capital increase in the war years. He became the leader of the National Liberal Party in the Reichstag and party chairman in 1917. When the party was about to split over the issue of the voting system in Germany, Stresemann was able to hold it together. Stresemann's own interest in foreign affairs in this period is also particularly surprising. In 1916, he paid a visit to Germany's ally, Turkey, and there he learned about the Ottoman Empire's systematic persecution of the Armenian population there, otherwise known as the Armenian Genocide. The German ambassador to Turkey, Paul Wolf Metternich, had expressed some sympathy towards the Armenian people following the deaths of almost one and a half million of the Armenian population. Perhaps surprisingly, Stresemann criticised Metternich's sympathies on this matter and recommended that Metternich be recalled and dismissed as the ambassador to Turkey. The war had led Stresemann to the right of German politics, but soon the whole edifice of the German Empire was to come crashing down. In 1918, the German Revolution saw the abdication of Kaiser Wilhelm II and a government now dominated by the Social Democrats. In November 1918, an armistice was signed by this new government that formally declared Germany's surrender. Many ordinary Germans, particularly those in the military which had suffered no decisive defeat in the war, saw this as a stab in the back by their new leaders. Such a humiliation was exacerbated by the punishing peace terms that were foisted upon Germany in the Treaty of Versailles. Germany was burdened with reparation payments to France, Britain and the USA that would cripple its economy for generations. At this juncture, Stresemann appears to have had a complete breakdown. But he returned to politics just a few months later to stake his claim in the new post-war Germany. Stresemann's inroads into the Republic were problematic, however. He initially faced rejection for his previous association with the right wing during the war years. Ever determined, he founded a new party, the German People's Party, banding together his former supporters from the right wing. At first, Stresemann appeared sceptical of the new Weimar Republic, whose very foundations had been rocked by multiple uprisings following the war. In 1919, communists had attempted to take control of the government in the Spartacist uprising. This was met with force by the government's use of the Freikorps, a group of mostly right-wing ex-servicemen who were used along with the army to combat the Spartacists on Germany's streets. In 1920, the Freikorps themselves launched an attempted coup. 
This was only brought to an end through mass strikes across Germany, encouraged by the Social Democrat government, which had the trade unions on their side. Following President Ebert's victory against the right-wing Freikorps, Stresemann was moved to accept the Weimar Republic as a permanent part of Germany's immediate future. Life in the Republic, however, remained dangerous. In 1922, the liberal politician Walter Rathenau was assassinated by another communist group seeking to overthrow the government. Then, in 1923, disaster struck once more. $972 billion! This was the equivalent amount today that Germany was forced to pay to the Allies in war reparations. Germany was struggling to keep up with the huge payments demanded each month, and at the end of 1922, its government stated that it would miss the next payment entirely. In response, French and Belgian forces occupied the Ruhr. The Ruhr was one of Germany's industrial heartlands situated on its western border. If the Germans would not pay, it appeared that the French would take the resources from this region themselves. The resultant crisis, with French and Belgian troops once again occupying a part of Germany, evoked echoes of the war that had just passed. The German government, under the Chancellor Wilhelm Kuno, responded in kind with a policy of passive resistance, in other words, telling their workers not to go to work. Civil disobedience was also encouraged against the French, and friction between occupying French troops and German workers resulted in the deaths of over a hundred German civilians. The crisis in the Ruhr had an even more devastating effect on the German economy. The Weimar Republic attempted to deal with Germany's fall in production by simply printing more money. Consequently, while the amount of printed German banknotes skyrocketed, the value of the German currency fell enormously. This was the hyperinflation that was to see wheelbarrow loads of banknotes being used to pay for one loaf of bread. In the Reichstag, a new emergency election ousted Kuno, the supporter of passive resistance. In his place stood Gustav Stresemann, now the Chancellor and Foreign Minister of a new Grand Coalition government that was to try and bring the crisis to heel. The President, still the same Friedrich Ebert who had dealt with the Kapp Putsch, triggered the Republic's emergency decree, Article 48, to give Stresemann enough powers to deal with the Ruhr crisis. On the 26th of September, 1923, Stresemann announced an end to passive resistance in the Ruhr. German workers were sent back to work. Emergency powers were employed to remove communist politicians in Saxony and Thuringia that had been illegally elected during the crisis and opposed the Weimar Republic. Stresemann's priority now was to get the French out of the Ruhr. In his own words, this was to remove the strangler from our throat. Resuming work in the Ruhr, however, would not immediately resolve the pressing issue of hyperinflation in Germany. To address hyperinflation, Stresemann abandoned Germany's valueless old currency. He established a Renten Bank with power to issue a new currency, the Renten Mark. In the absence of gold or any other means to prop this currency up, Stresemann mortgaged off Germany's industrial and agricultural land. 2400 million Renten Marks were created. Half went to the government, the other half to supply credit to industry. Now German workers could be paid. And, additionally, communism might lose some of its appeal among the working classes. Hjalmar Schacht was appointed currency commissioner by Stresemann, the same Schacht who would later work for the Nazis. Nevertheless, Schacht's work ensured that the new currency held steadfast to re-stabilise the German economy. The government made cuts, reducing salaries and sacking 300,000 employees, in addition to increasing taxation. The outside world called it the miracle of the Renten Mark. For Stresemann's government, it was simply one large step on the road to a new, more stable Germany. Stresemann's time as Chancellor, however, was short. He served only 100 days in the position from the 13th of August to the 23rd of November 1923, before he resigned after a vote of no confidence in his position. Such was the nature of frequent political infighting that took place during this tumultuous period in Germany's history. Nevertheless, Stresemann remained involved in German politics and served as foreign minister to all succeeding cabinets until his own death on the 3rd of October 1929. As foreign minister, Stresemann continued to play an important role in government as Germany emerged from the crisis of 1923 into a stable, more prosperous period. In the years that followed, it appears that Stresemann became much more of an internationalist, seeking to build bridges between Germany and those of its former enemies of the First World War, in April 1924, Stresemann negotiated the Dawes Plan with the USA. This provided a modified settlement of the reparations issue, 
lessening the amount that needed to be paid each month and fueling the German economy by means of an American loan over a period of five years. This financial boon was of course beneficial to Germany, but also placated the French who were still in the Ruhr, showing a way forward out of the crisis of 1923. Relations with the French were to be further improved in another of Stresemann's crowning achievements of the 1920s. This was the Locarno Pact, a product of a series of conferences held in 1925 that restored Germany to a more respected position on the world stage. In the Locarno Pact, Germany, France and Belgium agreed to respect each other's frontiers. This territory, including the demilitarised zone of the Rhineland, a controversial clause of the Treaty of Versailles in itself, was to become permanent and was guaranteed by Britain and Italy. France also set out a timeline to leave the Ruhr, finally bringing a formal closure to the crisis that had caused so much damage to Germany in 1923. A treaty of arbitration between France and Germany pledged that all further disputes between these age-old enemies would be resolved through the League of Nations, the new international organisation set up by the Treaty of Versailles. Germany, which had previously been excluded from the League of Nations, was to be admitted in 1926. In all, the Locarno Pact was a remarkable achievement in the context of the fractious relationship that had existed between France and Germany in the aftermath of the First World War. Church bells across Germany rang out upon the announcement of the Locarno Pact, which seemingly heralded a new era of peace and cooperation after the destruction of the most terrible war that the world had ever seen. Stresemann, along with the French Foreign Minister Briand, gained the Nobel Peace Prize for their work in securing the Locarno Pact. This was awarded in 1926, the very same year that Germany was at last welcomed into the League of Nations. But was Stresemann, Germany's long-serving foreign minister, really putting peace above all else? The Locarno Pact guaranteed Germany's borders to the west, but its borders to the east were a different question. Here, Stresemann made no such commitment. There would be no Locarno of the east, he is reported as saying in 1925. Stresemann evidently remained somewhat committed to the idea of German nationalism, and within that, a degree of hostility to the Treaty of Versailles remained in his agenda too. The treaty had, after all, removed large numbers of German-speaking people from Greater Germany in 1919. In fact, secret military cooperation with the Soviet Union had already allowed Germany to begin a process of rearmament that was expressly forbidden by the Treaty of Versailles. Clandestine military exercises were held in Soviet territory to avoid the prying eyes of Britain and France. The Treaty of Rapallo, agreed in 1922 between Germany and the USSR, provided diplomatic cover for such military training, and also allowed for the construction of a flying school at Lipetsk and two factories for the production of German tanks near Moscow and Rostov-on-Don. Disarmament, if it was to be done at all, Stresemann argued, had to be done by the French and the British as well. For all the talk of peace in the 1920s, this was clearly not happening. The French had already displayed their military might through the occupation of the Ruhr. Although Stresemann had ruled out the use of force to resolve international disputes, Germany's secret rearmament and the open question of its eastern border still allowed for potential German expansion in the future. Stresemann of course cannot be blamed for the aggressive expansionism that was to come in the Third Reich, but his diplomatic reinterpretations of the Treaty of Versailles undoubtedly undermined the legitimacy of that post-war agreement in the long term. Stresemann's key aim throughout the 1920s was to make Germany free from the harsh reparation payments of the Treaty of Versailles. Instrumental to his policy was a better relationship with the booming economy of the United States. Stresemann had already fostered a deal with the US in the Dawes Plan of 1924, this had helped Germany to get back on its feet after the heavy blow of hyperinflation. In 1928, Stresemann now signed the International Treaty for the Renunciation of War with delegates from France and the USA. This treaty, more widely known as the Kellogg-Briand Pact after its American and French signatories, agreed that not France, nor Germany, nor the USA would ever again use force to resolve disputes between themselves. Yet again, it seemed that the European future was a road adorned by the garlands of peace. Out of this came another agreement with the USA, the Young Plan, which was to secure another round of loans to aid Germany's reparations payments. Stresemann, now an older, ill man, rose from his sickbed to sign the Kellogg-Briand Pact in 1928. The following October, he suffered a stroke and died. In his lifetime, Gustav Stresemann had seen Germany transformed from a powerful nationalist state to a defeated fragile shadow and finally into a liberal republic. 
in the 1920s, he had shown himself to be a remarkable statesman, whose leadership and diplomacy carved a new role for Germany in the world after its surrender in the First World War. But there was to be yet another tragic twist in Stresemann's tale, for in the same month that he died, the US economy, on which so much of German industry now depended, collapsed. The Wall Street crash of 1929 triggered a Great Depression around the world that was particularly felt in Germany. Stresemann's hard-earned achievements, tying the German economy to that of its American helpers through loans in the Dawes Plan and Young Plan, were scuppered. American banks called back their money. Germany was left with nothing. The fallout of yet another economic catastrophe saw an increasing polarisation of German politics. This led to the installation of Adolf Hitler as Chancellor of the Reichstag in 1933. The new Nazi government sought not reconciliation with its neighbours, but a renewal of hostilities with its opponents that it regarded as unfinished from the First World War. In the years that followed, the agreements of the Locarno Pact and the Kellogg-Briand Pact were undone as Germany invaded its neighbours and began the Second World War. Stresemann's story, however, reveals to us the statesmanship and diplomatic character needed to hold a country together in a time of turmoil. The brief period between the wars saw Germany remake itself under Stresemann's careful hand, carefully balancing German tradition and nationalism with the need to accept the outcomes of the First World War, however undesirable this may have been. It was Stresemann's personality, one historian writes, that so impressed itself on German policy and foreign affairs during these years that it is truly right to speak of a Stresemann era. I very much hope that you enjoyed this episode of the History Chronicles on Gustav Stresemann. Please do like, subscribe and turn on notifications for our page. And of course, do support our Patreon if you're able. See you again for some more history.